You know what really gets my goat? El Chupacabra. Double lock your doors. Say your prayers. And whatever you do, don't go outside. <laughs> Jinkies, El Chupacabra. Yikes. What does that mean in English? Scooby-Doo and the Monster of Mexico. Did you say monster? Hello, I'm here this time to talk about another Scooby-Doo movie that I love. Before you get your pitchforks out after seeing the title like with what happened with my Cass Elliot video, let's state right away that I love this movie and I am not calling it out. We are having fun and being silly and goofy, okay? We're having fun on this channel today. Before we looked at the directed video movie that came directly after this, Scooby-Doo and the Loch Ness Monster. Go check out that video if you haven't. But this time we're stepping back for another movie I had on VHS and was obsessed with watching as a kid for some reason. Before we get into the story of Mr. Incorporated traveling to Mexico to help the Otero family. Let's start with some history first. I promise it's all relevant, to me at least, hence my video. In 1998, the Scooby-Doo franchise was dwindling. Made-for-TV movie Scooby-Doo in Arabian Nights was released in 1994, the final film to feature Don Messick in the role of Scooby, and the final time Casey Kasem would voice Shaggy until What's New Scooby-Doo in 2002. In my opinion, this is the worst Scooby movie, and from what I can tell, it's not especially loved by others. Whether or not that has anything to do with it, by 1998, the franchise was on hiatus with no new media since it was released. Do monsters send you screaming? You are not alone. You're in the Scooby Zone. Scooby. This year would see the release of the now iconic Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island, of which in the third episode of a podcast named Scooby-Doo, Lance Falk noted that the Scooby-Doo brand had tested well with mothers in a survey, so Warner Brothers decided to bring the franchise back for just one direct-to-video movie. And since it was supposed to be a one-off, time was more relaxed and there was less studio interference than usual. Franchise veterans Davis Doig, Glenn Leopold, Jim Stenstrom, and Lance Falk would serve as the creative heads. The cast would utilize an entirely new set of actors except for Frank Welker as Fred, who had been voicing the character since the very beginning. Don Messick had unfortunately passed in 1997, and while Frank Frank Welker was approached to take on the role in addition to Fred, he was hesitant at the time, so Messick was now replaced by Scott Innes. Casey Kasem was set to return until they refused to make Shaggy vegan, so he turned down the return twice, being replaced by Billy West, who himself would not return to the role in any films after this. Heather North, who had been voicing Daphne since 1970 starting in the original second season of Scooby-Doo Where Are You, was set to return and did a full day of recording, only to be quickly replaced by Mary Kay Bergman, who would re-record and continue from where she left off. The producers, after hearing North's performance, decided they wanted a fresher take on the role. And I'm assuming, having heard her in the movie we're discussing in this video, that her voice just sounded a little old by now for what they were going for. At first glance, this modest playground looks like any other. But the children here in Veracruz are fearful, and have good reason to be. BJ Ward, meanwhile, would take on Velma, a role she had been playing since the year before in the episode of Johnny Bravo, Bravo Doobie Doo, and would continue the role for the next three films before leaving. Since the movie didn't have the usual studio interference, it would end up being the darkest film entry in the franchise to date. But this worked to the advantage of the film, as it was a huge financial success and led Warner to finally see the potential of the franchise again, leading them to greenlight more direct-to-video film follow-ups. Though these next three in the series would be much more toned down at the request of the studio, who was now paying attention. It's the all-new, fully animated movie, Scooby-Doo and the Witch's Ghost. The all-new movie, Scooby-Doo and the Alien Invaders. Only on video cassette and DVD. The next two movies, Witch's Ghost and Alien Invaders, would feature the same cast with the small change of Scott Innes now voicing Shaggy as well as Scooby. <laughs> Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase, only on video cassette and DVD. But the fourth and final in this miniseries dubbed The Dark Era, Scooby-Doo and the Cyber Chase, would see a new voice for Daphne take over. Mary Kay Bergman tragically took her own life in 1999, and so Great Lyle Griffin, her friend and student, would take on the role for this film, though she wouldn't become the permanent voice until Scooby-Doo and the Loch Ness Monster. Again, you can go watch that video. Switching to digital animation for the first time, this film would ultimately see issues arise in production, something the last two had seen as well. The studio interference now happening had caused severe problems with the creative team for Witch's Ghost, which led to Alien Invaders having more freedom, but this time the studio involvement would ramp up again, and it was nearly impossible to save production, as the studio had contracted a writer who wrote scenes too hard to animate in the time frame with hand-drawn animation, with a large amount of outsourced animation for scenes that had to be cleaned and fixed. The frustrations from the interference would ultimately prove to be too much, and despite having a fifth movie in this series written, the four-person creative team would disband, ending the Dark Era. And so we finally get to where we're going with the second era of DTV films, starting with Legend of the Vampire, produced in 2002, but held until 2003, likely due to the 2002 live-action film. And the movie we're discussing here also released in 2003, which would end this two-film era. Now produced entirely by Warner Bros. Animation at this point, stylistically, the two films would switch back to the classic ways. No more real monsters, just guys in a mask. Classic Hanna Barbera goofy sound effects would make the return, the classic music score of Ted Nichols would be remade, the 1971 Hanna Barbera logo is used after the credits, and the design of the gang would be much more classic. 
a mix between the originals and the ones of what's new Scooby-Doo, leaving behind a modern and darker visual style and costumes established in the previous era. As for the cast, we would see that change to something more classic as well. Frank Welker, of course, would return as Fred. Leave today or you won't see tomorrow. But like in the series What's New Scooby-Doo, he would now take on the role of Scooby after being previously hesitant. Yeah, we were rather. <laughs> as Casey Kasem finally returned as Shaggy in What's New, he returned for these films as well, and would continue the role for six more years until the 2009 film Scooby-Doo and the Samurai Sword. Well, like pleasant dreams, Scoob. Nicole Jaffe, the original voice of Velma, would return to the role for the first time since 1974 just for these two films. We can't leave here until we find Daphne. And lastly, Heather North Kinney, who is the most recognizable voice of Daphne, having voiced her from 1970 to 1986, and who had previously returned as Daphne for Zombie Island only to be replaced, would finally get her chance to reprise the role in these final two movies one last time in her final performance before her death in 2017. I was afraid to go to sleep and thought some Latin rhythms would calm me down. After these two films, we would see a third era of film start where the voice cast and art style would switch over to the cast and style of what's new. For more on that era, I covered it briefly in the Loch Ness video you can go watch. We're not here for that one. Not important, but these two films would also get a special unique bonus feature utilizing Welker and Kasem as the two perform as their three characters in full movie audio commentaries, something they would continue for a few other films after like Pirates of Hoy. This movie, like Loch Ness After, also contains a delightful fake blooper reel. <laughs> Seriously, start making these again. You can find the whole segment on YouTube, go check it out. So, let's get into it. What's the tea on this particular entry? Let's start with the big guy before we go over the movie itself. This is transformative content. I'm not here to be your first exposure to this movie, unless you want me to be. Scooby-Doo and the Monster of Mexico, the sixth direct-to-video Scooby-Doo film, released in 2003, isn't the first time Mystery Incorporated has gone to Mexico. They've certainly made their way there in episodes before, but this is the first time that going there is the whole focus. And they certainly got it spot on. I mean, the Olay sign. Fred's got his sombrero. We got the taco stand. And Scooby's love interest is a chihuahua, they celebrate the Day of the Dead, there's Rodriguez, and a bullfight! Sounds exactly right, just like Scotland in Loch Ness. And as for the titular monster, we get what the movie describes as Mexico's version of Bigfoot, originating from the local area. The thing is, the Chupacabra does not originate from Mexico. His legend comes from Puerto Rico, and he's definitely not a Bigfoot type. Chupacabra in English means goat sucker. You know what really gets my goat? First sighted in the 1970s in Puerto Rico, and coming to prominence in 1995, the real, well, you know what I mean, the real Chupacabra Cabra was named after its vampiric habits of sucking blood of livestock, especially goats. And the typical descriptions of the creature are very different from that of this movie. In the American Southwest, the Chupacabra is typically described as being fairly dog-like in appearance, while sightings in Puerto Rico and Latin America tend to say it's more reptilian or alien-like, sometimes the size of a small bear. He's been reportedly seen in Maine, he's been seen in Chile, he's been in Russia and the Philippines, he's been far and wide. In 1975, after a string of livestock killings in the Puerto Rican town of Mocha, it was initially believed the killings were committed by satanic cults, but continued killings would happen across the island with loss of animal life across multiple farms, each animal having been reportedly bled dry by two small teeth marks as if by a vampire, leading them to dub the creature the Vampire of Mocha. Elsewhere in Puerto Rico, the first attack attributed to the mysterious Chupacabra happened in March of 1995, when eight sheep were found dead with three puncture wounds in each of their chests, drained of blood again. In August, eyewitness account Madeline Toletino reported seeing the creature in a town where at least 150 farm animals and pets were found killed. Soon after the reportings, Puerto Rican comedian and entrepreneur Silverio Perez would coin the name Chupacabras, and attacks in other countries would start to slowly become reported as well, with sightings continuing into recent years. Benjamin Radford, following a five-year investigation, published his book Tracking the Chupacabra, where he deduced that most of these reportings in 1995 were too similar to the film Species released that year, which featured alien creatures nearly identical to the descriptions, and concluded that it undermined the credibility of the Chupacabra's existence. Likewise, the reports of sucking blood were never confirmed, and a veterinarian, after examining 300 animals reportedly attacked, concluded that they had not been bled dry. Radford divides the reports into two categories, those from Puerto Rico and Latin America, where animals were attacked and drained of blood, and those from America, where the creature was usually found to be dogs or coyotes with mange. University of Michigan biologist Barry O'Connor concluded all of these American reports were typically sick coyotes with a condition that left them with little fur, thick skin, and a rank odor, explaining the look of the creature. He theorized that the attacks on goats were because the animals were so weakened by their state that they had a hard time hunting, and were forced to attack the easier obtained livestock. Likewise, there were reports of stray Mexican hairless dogs being mistaken for the creature. So ultimately, is El Chupacabra real? He's about as real as our friend Nessie, we'll leave it at that. But as for all the times he's been reported, he's definitely never been described as a Bigfoot like in Monster of Mexico. Actor Rip Taylor, who voiced Mr. Smiley, said the original title of the film was Beware of the Bigfoot, and I wouldn't be surprised if the movie started with Mr. Bigfoot in mind, only to be shifted to something they thought sounded like it fit Mexico better down the line. That's where it gets complicated to figure out where the movie is and isn't self-aware though. 
You see, getting a little ahead of ourselves, the twist of this movie is that the obvious bad guys, Evil Dolly Parton, yeah, I mean Charlene, and Mr. Smiley, are the only white people around trying to scam the locals, and they expose themselves by being super white and not knowing the culture. So given that the whole charade falls apart because they're too white to do proper research into another culture and commit to the bit, who's to say that the Chupacabra is incorrectly a Bigfoot because Charlene and Mr. Smiley just didn't know any better, and not because the movie itself got it wrong. I mean, Charlene's whole innocent dumb country girl act is just hiding that she, a blonde haired white woman, the only only white person involved with the Otero family is a cover-up to hide that she's only there to infiltrate a hard-working Mexican family to exploit their wealth and steal their land. Sounds about white to me. One thing to suggest the movie is at least self-aware enough to give it the benefit of the doubt right now on Mr. Bigfoot is Mr. Smiley's Latin adventure itself. Paco, a bird animatronic sent by Mr. Smiley and designed for his planned theme park, shows up to accuse the gang of breaking an ancient monument, and is clearly voiced by a white man speaking exclusively in a very obvious stereotypical fake accent. I protect the pyramids here at the place of the gods! That's the worst Spanish accent I've ever heard. I know. He looks like a character from a tacky theme park. This is pretty clearly a direct reference to Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room, an iconic Disneyland attraction that debuted in 1963, full of talking animatronic birds speaking in similar stereotypical accents. Oh, look at all the people. Welcome to Walt Disney's Enchanted Tiki Room. Hey, Michael, me amigo. Pay attention, it's show time. Mr. Smiley's entire plan that Mr. Smiley's entire plan revolves around stealing the land of the Otero family to bring a new version of his theme park to Mexico to exploit the culture for profit. Not dissimilar to Disney's capitalistic theme park takeover across the globe. to exploit the culture for profit. Not dissimilar to Disney's capitalistic theme park takeover across the globe. And it hadn't happened yet, but have we forgotten the time Disney tried to trademark the Day of the Dead for the film Coco? We can take a little look at the oddities in the movie later. It certainly makes the case for the movie actually just not being self-aware and having problems, but if nothing else, Scooby Doo does not approve of capitalism exploiting other cultures. Okay, we've done enough beating around the bush, so let's break down this movie and see what's up. Like I said before, I had this one on VHS as a kid, and I loved it. It was weirdly one of my favorites, and I still had the VHS until I finally got the Blu-ray. Speaking of the Blu-ray, this movie is weirdly the only DTV Scooby movie released on Blu-ray that's gone out of print and become hard to find. For a second, I was worried I wouldn't be able to find a copy to complete my collection. What a weird anomaly. Anyway, this one has always been a favorite, like Loch Ness or Where's My Mummy? And when I finally rewatched it on VHS a few years ago, it still held up for me. The approach to a different culture as we've seen, however, can be a little interesting. As for those voice actors we spent so long discussing, I love that this and Legend of the Vampire before it brought back the legacy cast one last time, even if they sound aged, except for Fred. Like I mentioned before, I love that Heather North Kinney is back as Daphne, but she sounded like she does here when she was recording for Zombie Island. I can understand why they chose to go in a different direction. I got up early and using my mud mask made a cast of the footprint from Bigfoot's Big Foot. She's still easily recognizable as Daphne. She for sure sounds like herself, but she also very clearly sounds aged. And for a poppy teenage to young adult character, the voice of a noticeably older woman respectfully is probably not the ideal direction. I love her so much, but she wasn't capable of pulling off this role the way she used to. I actually think Nicole Jaffe fares a little better in her final turn as Velma. Real or fake? Somebody's been following us. She's also easily recognizable as herself, and though she sounds aged and a little slower on the delivery, I don't think it's so much that she's a distraction in the role. Casey Kasem's return to the role at this point, in my opinion, is also a little weathered, and I would say at times distracting. Why don't we do a thorough search of the van, and if everything checks out okay, keep guard right here! I also feel this way about his performance in what's new and the subsequent films until he retired from the role. It's not as bad as it would get, but you could tell his age was catching up to him when it came to keeping up the voice. I fell down the rabbit hole and spent a day learning about his tragic and disturbing final years while researching this, so I especially by no means want to speak badly on his performance in this role. He is shaggy, and I love him, but you can definitely hear that he's no teenager by this point, like the girls. Not that they ever were when voicing them. Fred is the only one to make it through sounding completely unbothered, something Frank Walker still achieves to this day. Okay, guys. On the count of three, we'll charge the door. As for the other actors in this movie, while obviously Rip Taylor is recognizable as Mr. Smiley and Candy Milo, the voice of Charlene, has been in everything under the sun, there's actually one voice actor who most people will recognize but might slip under the radar here. Sofia Otero, Alejo's wife, is voiced by Maria Canals Barrera. You must be hot and tired after your long trip. While she's most visually recognizable as Teresa in Wizards of Waverly Place or the mom from Camp Rock, she's had a good voice acting career as well. She's Sunset Boulevardes and the Proud Family in the recent excellent sequel, Louder and Prouder. She's Hot Girl in the series Justice League and All Related. Lady Bruce Tim shows, and the character I always forget she voiced, Paulina and Danny Phantom. That one just seems wild, and yet, when I remember, it's so obvious. As for Alejo's mom, Doña Dolores, she's voiced by the biggest star of the film, none other than legendary Academy Award winner Rita Moreno. If anyone's still alive to honor the dead. Though we fall into that weird area where both she and Alejo's voice actor, Eddie Santiago, are Puerto Rican, not Mexican. As for the animation, having been released in 2003, it's early stage digital work, and it really shows. The quality of the line art, coloring, shading on characters, camera work, background, 
sounds, everything feels not cheap or lazy per se, but like it's being produced by a team that maybe doesn't quite know what to do with digital animation production work to the best degree yet, and going by what happened with Cyber Chase, maybe didn't have a huge amount of time to perfect things. The background art is covered in textures that look like I turned on one of the random texture filters that came in basic Photoshop, and you can see animation errors all over the movie, including even leaving little specks on screen that were meant to be erased. And it's very interesting that this movie feels this way because the movie that came directly after this in the new era of films, Loch Ness, released only a year later, looks great in comparison despite also being digital animation. The thing is, I'm not saying this like it's a bad thing. For me at least, I've seen others fold it for it, but for me, I love that it feels like you can see the human touch all over this movie because it actually makes it feel like the original series, which also has an admittedly cheap look and feel to it where it feels like people made this. And I love that feeling. So how about that plot? Let's get into it. The film opens up, of course, in Mexico, where Alejo Otero and his son Jorge are performing on the street, only for the legally required Mexican pet chihuahua, Chiquita, to get distracted from her dance to chase something, followed by Jorge. Realizing his son is gone, Alejo is horrified and runs to find him. Good thing there's a place for tacos around every quarter in case he gets hungry. Unfortunately, Chiquita and Jorge are found before Alejo, but he gets there in time to swoop them up and warns everyone of El Chupacabra. Meanwhile, in the opening credits, we get something even scarier, Comic Sans. Since this is a period piece of the early 2000s, we get the You've Got mail notification of old, which is really funny and dated 19 years later. Fred gets an email from his online pen pal Alejo, who offers he and the rest of the gang the opportunity to come visit Mexico and stay at his family hotel. Meanwhile, Daphne is busy being horny looking at whatever the hell this is, and Velma is apparently looking into laser eye surgery? Honestly, both of these are hilarious, I don't care if you don't think so. Shaggy and Scooby aren't into the trip like those two, however, so Velma explains the Day of the Dead festival they'll be attending, and they sell it to them on the food, getting everyone on board as they make sure to pack salsa. Very important. We get our first billboard in America for Mr. Smiley's fantastic fun land theme park as the gang heads to the border, and we get some silly goofy customs antics as well as the gang are messing around down their way. Thankfully, those taco stands are everywhere as the gang makes sure to pick up their appropriation souvenirs. Olay! Scooby bounces himself into a bullfight, which I'm sure is very accurate to something that would happen, and the gang finally make it to Alejo's. He doesn't look like he could eat you out of house and home. He's got a high metabolism. Alejo explains these are the guest cottages and takes them to his family's hotel proper, introducing his family, including his... nine children? Well, only Jorge is his. The gang just kind of assumed. Which is definitely not a racially motivated stereotype that we will gloss over. And we can't forget the legally required Mexican pet Chihuahua Chiquita, who gets to be Scooby's love interest. Imagine those babies. I think Scooby has already won someone's heart. Finally, we get introduced to Alejo's brother Luis and his fiancée Charlene, who he explains he met at Mr. Smiley's Fantastic Funland in America. Hey, that a uh -huh. I just love these loco customs. Oh, <laughs> loco, that's crazy in Mexican. <laughs> I mean Spanish. Charlene chronically is dropping coffee beans everywhere, and even Scooby gets to join in on the treat. Shaggy is thrilled to experience a fiesta, and Leo tells him it's typically followed by a siesta, which Velma then explains leads to hard work. They did not like that part. We then meet Diego Fuente, who asks Alejo's mom to excuse them so he can talk to her sons, and she explains he used to work for her husband, and she does not trust him. He is a... how you say in America? Crook? Liar? Con man? Jerk? Diego excuses himself after being told no, and Alejo explains that he wants to buy their property. Luis thinks it might be a good idea, but Alejo is intent on keeping the promise they made to their father to keep the hotel running. They ask the gang how they plan to spend their first day, but when they say they want to watch the Day of the Dead festival preparations, they're told about the Chupacabra attacks as the storm hits. Inside, Alejo explains that the attacks are why the hotel is empty, since the attacks here and in nearby villages started soon after he emailed Fred, and that he tried to warn him not to come, but it was too late. El Chupacabra. I've read about him. He's Mexico's version of the Bigfoot. Actually, Velma, that's not right. We've been over this. You'd think she of all people would know better. That's a strike against the movie being self-aware. Or maybe she's just white. Alejo explains the creature he saw, but Fred assures them it's just a myth and they decide to go to bed. But just in case, double lock your doors. Say your prayers. And whatever you do, don't go outside! Back in the room, a prepared Shaggy and Scooby hear a scary noise and freak out, finding Fred and Velma outside, and they realize Daphne isn't there, so they run to her room. Daphne wakes up overhearing them and opens the door as they charge inside. She didn't hear the noise because she had been listening to music to calm her down, and joins the search where they find footprints leading to the window and then off to the hotel. They assumed they scared whatever it was away and go back to bed. The next morning, Daphne makes a cast of a footprint and they notice some speckles that Velma confirms isn't dirt, but she can't be sure what it is. Alejo and Luis decide the women shouldn't be told about what happened last night so they don't get scared, and they worry about what this could do to their business and the others around. Fred tries to speak broken Spanish, and Charlene gives Luis a special medallion to bring him good luck, making him promise to never take it off. Alejo shows the gang around the area, noting how empty of tourists it is because of the attacks, so the gang decide to interview some locals with Daphne as reporter. She asks some kids what the chupacabra looks like, and... A gorilla! Who 
is lying to these kids? We've been over this. What does El Chupacopter do? It's good. Close enough. Will he show up tomorrow at the Day of the Dead festivities? Or will he remain as elusive as the Loch Ness Monster or the perfect boyfriend? Wow, foreshadowing for the Nessie movie. And how does she know about my love life? When they get back to the van, they find someone wrote something in Spanish across it, which Fred translates as a warning. So everyone decides to split up and find some clues. Wanting to be safe, Shaggy and Scooby hide in the van as someone drains the brake fluid. Fred, Daphne, and Velma run into a statue of Quetzalcoatl, who looks very different without the giant honkers. They run into a medicine man who says he's never heard of a creature like the Chupacabra and that our animal friends would never harm people with no reason. He believes the only evil here is capitalism from a group in America, who hoped to capitalize on tourists but were turned away by the locals and vowed to return. Oh, and did I also mention you're in grave danger? Uh, no. I think you skipped that part. You're in grave danger. After he tells them to look to the past, the trio decide they need to warn the others and... If you have any more questions, Check out my website at www.ancientmexicanwisdom.com. Please, that's funny, don't boo. Fred says goodbye with more of his fail Spanish, and the brothers get separated as Alejo gets attacked by the creature. Scooby and Shaggy are woken up by the growls and speed away, leaving a trail of the draining fluid. The trio feel like they're lost, while Luis finally reappears to save Alejo, claiming he was knocked out. Meanwhile, Shaggy realizes he can't stop the van and drives all over. Coyotes? And jaguars? And boars. Oh my! A loud growl roars out, and the trio run directly into the brothers where they hear a coyote, and though Alejo says they're more afraid of humans, it runs right past them, terrified of something else. They look up and see the chupacabra itself as it starts the chase, and when they get back to town, they realize that the van is gone and was leaking. The chupacabra catches back up and chases them all over, creating chaos. Here, we get a really cool shout to the previous movie, Legend of the Vampire. The unstoppable van flashes by, and they jump on to escape, and Shaggy reveals that they can't stop, but thankfully, they're out of gas just as they reach a gas station. Luis believes it must be good luck from Charlene's medallion. Alejo gets some ice for Luis's head to help him with the pain from the attack, though he seems dodgy about it. Back on the road, the gang see a sign for a museum and decide it would be a perfect way to look toward the past. Though we see mysterious hands remove the sign, revealing it's a fake. On the way to the museum, they see a billboard advertising a new tourist attraction, a local version of Mr. Smiley's theme park. The gang search the museum for any clues to solve the mystery and find themselves rolling into a room meant to be closed thanks to yet another switched sign. A tour guide suddenly shows up to lead them to a theater where they see animatronics pop out to tell the dark story of the Aztecs. She takes Daphne on stage to demonstrate, and they all disappear. Her voice over the loudspeaker tells them that they've been warned, and though Shaggy and Scooby are ready to go, the others aren't leaving without Daphne. Thelma finds a ripped label from the costumes reading Mile Enter, and Fred grabs a torch to see it better only to trigger a trap door. Shaggy trips and grabs hold of another trigger as everyone slides down into several traps until they finally make it to a ledge and find a door to the outside pyramids. And on top of one, they see Daphne tied up. Where am I? They make their way up to her and explore the area where Velma notices a statue that wasn't there earlier and suddenly crumbles, triggering a cage and alarms. The aforementioned racist animatronic talking eagle from earlier, Paco, drops by to say that they just destroyed an ancient monument to turn tourists against them, and they're chased all over the pyramids and into a crack. Daphne is spooked by some spiders, which Velma gets to correct her on being scorpions, only for Alejo to point out the rats as everyone runs into the ancient tombs to hide. We can disguise ourselves by wearing the traditional clothing of the native Indian skeletons. Okay, forget everything else, this is the worst thing they do in the movie. Velma, no less. I expected more of her. Desecrating the corpses of the native people for them to escape? This one I cannot defend. This is bad, girl. Holy shit, I forgot this. Thankfully, they don't get away with that shit. The gang are run off where they find a bunch of statues that come to life, and it's not really clear if they are magical or also animatronic like Paco. Kind of confusing. Like this one? Is this a big animatronic or a big statue that really came to life? Are they flying on a real creature? The big kitties attack Paco like real kitties. What's going on here? Like, actually, what is this? The giant statue crushes itself to dust, so like, this is real? What? This movie's just off the rails since they got here. Anyway, they see Diego Fuente, and Fred says he must be trying to attack them, and everybody reconvenes as they escape. Paco falls from the sky, proving he was an animatronic, and so the gang heads back as the preparations for the Day of the Dead festival begin, though the Chupacabra is keeping watch. Scooby shows up for Chiquita, embarrassing himself. Doña Dolores is being comforted as everyone comes up, asking what happened to Charlene. Please, calm down, both of you, there's nothing to be upset about. El Chupacabra has run off for your fiancé! We'll never see her again!
Sophia explains that right after they left, the Chupacabra broke down the door and took off with Charlene and nobody was able to find her. Fred has everyone stop to get their facts straight, as they put together that someone wants the Chupacabra to scare everyone in the village and get tourists out of the way. With Fred pointing out if tourists are gone, Alejo will be forced to sell their land to Diego Fuente. Daphne says that they can't rule out the supernatural though because of how real the creatures of the pyramids were, and she's right, they never explained that, so what the hell were they? Either way, Velma is certain they're being followed, so they look back at the videos they filmed before. Fred realizes the Spanish written on the van was written wrong, clearly by someone who doesn't speak the language. Whoever wrote manana, the Spanish word for tomorrow, forgot the tilde. It's a symbol you put over the end to change the pronunciation. Without it, the word would be said incorrectly as manana, instead of manana. Fred still manages to get this wrong though, and yet again I'm not sure if the movie is just broken or if Fred is super white. You see, he wrote this manana when he was supposed to write this manana. So technically he's correcting something and yet correcting to something still wrong? A mistake no real Spanish speaking person would ever make. Looks like your Spanish lessons are finally paying off. Oh! Muchas gracias! Anyway, they also realize that there could be more than one bad guy at play, and they remember the clue from before they still can't decipher. Meanwhile, it's time for the festival to begin, and the family leaves offerings for their father. Suddenly, his spirit comes out of the grave, causing Doña Dolores to faint. He explains that the Chupacabra is a result of a curse on their land, and they must sell it to get rid of the creature and get Charlene back. However, Alejo sees through it, noting that the ghost doesn't sound or look like his father at all, and is clearly fake. Fred takes a look at Luis's medallion, realizing it's a tracking device, and sets it in reverse, leading the dogs to find the source. Behind the curtain, a skeleton man is controlling the ghost for our second Oz reference. Weird. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. He tries to continue his warnings, but everyone comes over to see, and Fred explains most of them don't understand English, and he should try Spanish. Why can't everyone just learn English? The skeleton tries to crawl away, but Daphne unmasks him as Mr. Smiley, and he's handcuffed as Velma reveals the clue was torn off from Smiley Entertainment. When the locals refuse to sell, he says sites on the Otero land, the best in the area, and wouldn't take no for an answer, so he came up with the idea of scaring away tourists to ruin their business. Being in the theme park business, he already had had access to special effects and animatronics to help him pull off the scheme, including creating bad publicity for the pyramids, which would be his main competitor. However, despite having caught Mr. Smiley, the Chupacabra reappears, coming in for its final attack as everyone flees. We get an extended chase as they goof off all over the cemetery, until the Chupacabra finally gets caught up in some lights, and they unmask it to be the tour guide. She explains she worked as an actress and stunt woman at the theme park, and when he saw her, it was love at first sight, leading Luis to ask where his own love, Charlene, is. She tells him to give up on her, and Luis is too heartbroken to do so, asking his father for a sign. They look over to his grave and realize that all the gifts they left for their father are gone, except the one left by Charlene as Velma figures it out. The tour guide suddenly drops coffee beans out of her sleeves as Velma walks over to unmask Charlene, who explains she never loved Luis and only wanted his money, which would become hers to share with Mr. Smiley once she got married and divorced him. Suddenly Diego Fuente shows up, explaining that he decided to respect their family wish, but realized the other two didn't understand loyalty and tried to warn them at the pyramids earlier. Everyone apologizes to him, with Luis realizing misunderstandings happen. Well, what happens now? We go to jail. What do you think happens? We could have made billions if it hadn't been for those meddling kids. I never trusted Senorita Charlene. That bruja. Luis confides to Alejo that when he was attacked, he did hear him. But after losing their father, he was paralyzed with fear, imagining losing him too, and lied to not look like a coward. There are worse things than being a coward. Yeah, like I've made a career out of it. And so everyone gets back to celebrating as they wonder how the Chupacabra myth got started in the first place. Like all myths, I guess. Since the beginning of time, men and women have loved to tell stories. And what better reason for creating them than to explain the many things we don't understand, and maybe never will. Everyone dances off together, and the movie comes to a close. Scooby Dooby Doo! <laughs> <laughs> Wow, now that we've taken a closer look, the uh, interesting portrayal of Mexican culture in the movie certainly does not hold up as well as I remember from a couple of years ago. There is enough oddities in here that I don't know that I can let the movie off the hook with being self-aware. Factually, this movie was written, directed, made in general by white people, and I think that's that. It's a weird little oddity of a movie, and I still love it. What a bizarre film. A mix between speaking on cultural appropriation and also participating in it at the same time. Okay, I've kept you here long enough if you're still watching by this point. I don't think there's much more to say about this particular film. I've been planning this video and taking notes for a year before finally making it, so hopefully you enjoyed what finally came of it. For some reason, ever since I was little, I've loved the co-villain of the movie, Charlene. Maybe it's just the Dolly Parton lover in me. I've also been fascinated by the Chupacabra too, like after watching the Loch Ness movie, though not as much. And I feel like this one does the creature a disservice. The real thing, well, you know, the real thing is so much more interesting. What do you think of the real Chupacabra myth? Did you also watch this movie a long time ago and become obsessed? What do you think of how this movie represents Mexico? What do you think of this middle era of direct-to-video films? Or anything else? 
else? I wanna know. That's the end of the video. I don't have another planned video to follow this one up with. This is the last one I had notes on to do. So if there's a movie or episode or whatever you want me to look into doing a video on, you can also let me know. I still have other obligations outside this channel, and I only want to do videos on things I have an interest in or something to say about. So if there's just nothing I have to say in it, like the zombie island air that's been done to death, or even Legend of the Vampire, those aren't ever going to be on the schedule. Anyway, subscribe to see the next video, whatever it may be. Like the video so the algorithm likes me too. Follow me on Twitter at Legend of Justice. Leave me a nice comment if you like the video, etc. Bye!